title of the talk was uh, what is resetting uh, in groups and they tricked you and it's about hyperconductivity for global functions no but it's actually about what is resets in groups and uh, hyperconductivity for global functions is the tool for and um, using stuff about them so for we begin i just that's what uh, external combinatorics is about so we're given a set of objects and want to understand how large can a set uh, be given some restrictions on the interrelations between the objects and the larger the largest sets that satisfy the restrictions is called the extremal set Okay, so let's give some example. And so one example that F a family of sets is intersecting if the intersection of each two sets in F is non empty. So this is an intersecting family. And here, the corresponding extremal uh, problem is to determine the largest intersecting family. And here, it's easy. So if, if it is intersecting, then its size should be at most 2 to the n minus 1, because for each set in f, its complement is not in f. So for each pair of set in its complement, we can only choose one. So the size of f should be at most two to the n minus one. Okay, but uh, what uh, Erdesh uh, asked has to make this problem more interesting. Uh, what happens if, um, the size of the sets in F, the sizes of the sets in F are restricted to be uh, of a given size. So what if the size of A is K for A in F? So what then is the largest intersecting family? And uh, here is the case where K is equal to two, and these are just graphs. And this is a non-intersecting graph, and these are the intersecting graphs. And what Erdos Kohen Rada showed that uh, the dictators, so families, families of, uh, of sets, they correspond to functions uh, to zero one, and the function fx equal to xi is called a dictator. And this, this uh, dictator in the Boolean, for Boolean functions corresponds to uh, the family of all sets that contain a given element. And what uh, Erdos Cohen Radov showed is that the extremely intersecting families are the dictators. And that's uh, the philosophy of the Erdos uh, Korado theorem. It, so instead, instead of trying to come up with interesting examples, it turns out that the most trivial ones are actually going to be extremely uh, of them. And, uh, <laughs> and this result started a uh, subfield of uh, Erdos Korado type problems when we are given uh, an extremal problem. And we are also given some dictators, some trivial sets that satisfy the restriction. And the goal is to show that the extremal sets that satisfy the restrictions are the dictators. So, as mentioned, uh, this terminology comes from social choice. So, we have a, a Boolean function, and we, that we we use to choose between two alternatives: uh, pizza and ice cream. And one such uh, Boolean function that we use is the dictator. So we just listen to the dictator to decide what to eat. And Another uh, important function or type of functions are the juntas. So, uh, 
there is a J thing that if it depends on a J variables and the, we should think of J as a constant. And uh, the dictator is a specific kind of junta and uh, and uh, yeah and dictator is a one junta and in general and here we have, we have a three junta when three people decide the outcome of the elections and we can basically throw all the other votes to the garbage and only look at the votes of these three people to determine who won and it turns out that this notion is important not only in the in the context of uh, social choice but it's also important in the context of uh, extremal combinatorics and the Irish quadra theorem. So, um, <coughs> so now, if we have a family of sets, we can say that it's uh, a J junta. Let's say that J is now a set of small size. If uh, the quotient is A in F, So if we want to know whether a set belongs to F, we can throw away all the coordinates outside of J. So this depends only on the intersection of A with J. So based on that, we decide whether F belongs to, uh, to uh, the family. And okay, let's give an example of an intersecting junta. So we can take the family of all sets of size k with intersection with the set one up to three is at least two. Uh, so that's an intersecting three junta. And what in Rod Friedwood, they show that all the uh, intersecting family are of this form. So if we want to construct an intersecting family, it's not only true that the largest intersecting families are, are dictators, but actually the, all the intersecting families, all the large intersecting families have a specific structure. They obtained from taking an intersecting junta and taking a subset of it. Because if we take a subset of an intersecting family, it's always going to be an intersecting family. And what they showed is that all the intersecting families are obtained from an intersecting junta by taking a subset and adding few elements outside of the intersecting junta. And what uh, Kevin and I showed is that intersecting with junta theorems are not only interesting uh, in their own right, but you can actually use them to solve other squad of theorems. And it, it turns out that the uh, uh, various other squad type problems that you can solve by first showing the, 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 the general structure of uh, families that satisfy the restrictions are the juntas. Okay, so what did we have so far? So we talked about uh, what are extreme problems, which are about how large can SMP satisfy certain uh, restrictions. We uh, talked about the Erdos-Corrado theorem, which says that the largest intersecting family is a dictator. And we talked about erdos corrado type theorems, which are the extreme problems with extreme dictators. And we talked about the Hunter method, which shows how to solve erdos corrado type uh, Problems. And now we are going to talk about some problem in additive combinatorics, which will turn out to be uh, related. So, um, yeah, so, okay. So, if you have a, a finite group, it's, uh, uh, we know it's a very important question to uh, study the sets that are called under multiplications. The, these are the subgroups of uh, the group. And uh, we're going to study the opposite question. What happens if the for each two sets in the set, if the product is not in the set? These are one of three sets. And, uh, <coughs> okay, so as a warm up, let's solve the problem when the group is the symmetric group. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for someone. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so if you take uh, the odd permutations, uh, 
uh, they have size. Uh, so, so if sigma is odd and tau is odd, then sigma tau is even. Uh, so this is a product free set. On the other hand, if A is product free, and uh, G is in A, then A and G A are disjoint. So one of them has to be, so, so this means that A has to be of at most one half, and this means that the odd permutations are uh, the largest product free set in the symmetric group. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the real problem that we care about, which is a uh, product free set in the alternating groups. And uh, Ben Green has a list of, uh, and this, Problem was uh, posed by Baba and Shosh in 1985. <clears throat> and uh, it is about uh, what is the largest product reset in the alternating group. And uh, Ben Green has a list of favorite handed open problems, and that's problem number four in that list. And it turns out uh, that even though this problem comes from multiplicative combinatorics, it's really about the dictators. It's related to these problems in extreme combinatorics, where the extreme solution is a dictator. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. Um, Okay, so, so what are the dictators in the alternative group? Uh, so earlier, one wanted to define uh, what is a dictator for set, families of sets. In order to determine whether a set belongs to the family, we only needed to, to check one coordinate, whether it belongs to the set or not. Here, it's the same thing. If we have a permutation, uh, we decide based on its value on one, whether it belongs to the dictator or not. <coughs> so these are the dictators, the set of all permutations that send one to a given set. And uh, so I said that the external product free sets are dictators, but actually these dictators are not product free. It's easy to show that if you have two permutations that send one to I, then the product doesn't necessarily send one to I. So you have to modify them a little bit. And uh, you do it as follows. So that's a uh, construction by a uh, liner. And you can uh, generalize it a little bit. Uh, so if you have a, a group that acts on a set X, you can take a uh, set of all G that send uh, uh, GX to I, but send GI uh, to uh, its complement. And that's a product free set because if, uh, yeah, so let's call it A. So if G is in A, then uh, G of X is in I. And if H is in A, then it means that H of G X is uh, not in I because H sends I to its complement. So it means that A G is not in the dictator. And, uh, and uh, the, the following conjecture by uh, Crane is that this is actually the external product free set in the other group. Uh, okay, so, so to, to make it extreme, do you need the, uh, uh, the big I is a single element or is it set? Uh, so uh, in the alternating group, you, you take I to be of size uh, roughly root N, and then the condition that I sent its complement happens with the constant probability. And the condition that x and y happens with probability one over root n. And that's somehow how you optimize the parameters. Wait, what is the exact conjecture? So the conjecture is that uh, if n is sufficiently large, the extremal family is always of this form. It's of this form for some i. For some set i. And you're telling us roughly how big those are. Yeah, so i, I is going to be roughly of size root n. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Gauss proved that uh, the external product preset 
at size at most, uh, its density at most, n to the minus cell. Eberhard then determined the external solution up to logarithmic factors, and we uh, solved this problem completely by showing that the external product three sets have are exactly this uh, family, these product three detectors. Okay, and so now let's uh, discuss a little bit uh, Gauss proof. And uh, just for simplicity, so we can talk about calligraph, let's assume that A is equal to its inverse, otherwise we'd have to talk about uh, directed calligraphs. And uh, the basic observation of Gauss was that A is independent set in the calligraph. That means that A doesn't contain any edges. So, um, yeah, so if we take a look at the calligraph, and, uh, and if A1 and A2 are in A, uh, so an, an edge corresponds, yeah, okay, so an edge corresponds to A1, A1, A2, and A2 that are all in A. So, so, so if A, so, so A is in an independent set in its own calligraph. It doesn't contain any edges. On the other hand, what Gauss proved is that we have a mixing in uh, this calligraph, and uh, which means that this graph uh, behaves like a random graph. And if we take two large sets, the number of edges between them is uh, roughly the same as in a random graph of the same density. And in, in particular, if we plug in A as B and C, we get that A uh, found to be independent. It must contain uh, edges, because it must contain many edges, actually. Okay, so, um, so let's, uh, <laughs> Let's um, talk a little bit about uh, Gauss proof. So, um, okay, so, so you can define an operator T, A, a second J of F of X to be the expectation over A and A of F A X. Is a convolution operator, and uh, if you take trace of T A star, so we assumed that uh, A is equal to its inverse, so that means that it's uh, a self-adjoint operator, and <clears throat> we don't forget that it's the sum of uh, the lambdas in its, the spectrum of T A of uh, the multiplicity of lambda times lambda squared. Well, on the other hand, we can uh, compute the trace of, uh, so I meant T squared. Well, on the other hand, if we, uh, what's the trace of T squared? This is like taking two steps of the random walk where we move from X uh, to a random AX. <clears throat> and then take another step of the random walk and we ask what's the probability that we get to the same place. This is uh, one over the size of A and we have to take it n factorial times. This is n factorial over the size of A. And therefore we get that uh, large M lambda implies small uh, lambda. And uh, yeah, so you can, if the multiplicity is large, you can, and the set is large, you can deduce that the eigenvalue is small. That's how you get an upper bound on the second eigenvalue, which is what you use in order to show that the Kelly graph is pseudo random. And uh, this is via representation theory. Okay, We're only using the smallest representation, uh, the dimension of the smallest irreducible. Yeah, so that's Gauss that argument. He uses only the 
dimension of the smallest, uh, uh, yeah, so smallest dimension of a representation. Uh, so this operator TA, it, com it has some symmetry because it commutes with multiplying from the other side, and that implies that each eigenvalue has to appear with a large multiplicity. And uh, this large multiplicity means that the eigenvalue must be uh, small. So that was Gauss argument. And let's say, and our idea. Uh, is to show that uh, one A, the indicator of A, is essentially supported uh, on eigenspaces corresponding. to very large numbers. So that's the idea. Uh, instead of, so if we know that, uh, if, if we knew that 1A is supported only on the small eigenvalues, then we could get an even better bound uh, and uh, about the size of A. And, and uh, was this problem looked at for other groups besides AN where the smallest dimension is actually really large in terms of the size of the group? Yes. yes. Uh, I mean, why are you looking at AN and not other, other uh, groups? Yeah. So, I mean, what properties of AN are you going to use besides this property? Yes. Yeah, so, so, we're going to use uh, a property that works uh, for uh, high rank, which replaces. Okay, so there are some groups that have this. Uh, Good spectral uh, gap, yeah. and usually when uh, the, the rank is small, yeah. and high rank, uh, the multiplicity is not that large. And then uh, hyperconductivity shows you, which is the term that, that we're going to talk about, uh, shows you that you're actually supported on the large dimensions. So, that that can get, uh, so you're using not just the smallest, like E walls, but you're using. Yeah, so the idea is to show that one is. Essentially, it's supported on the large dimensions. And you can what, for important. What is the answer for other families of finite simple groups? Um, yeah. I mean, it's the yeah, same project. No, but they did it. So, Gowers and Nikolov and Bataille. Ah, no, 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 so they, they, the bound of Gowers. The order of magnitude, I'm, I'm sure you can get yeah. quite easily from this. Yeah. The uh, exact. Yeah, so that's what you've done here was to say that the extreme is of this form, right? Yeah. Uh, is yes, that known in other groups? Um, so, is it known exactly? I don't think so, but uh, it, it's very possible that our methods would be applicable for SLP of FP and uh, for SLN of FP. And uh, we also have some groups that we know that it's not all uh, compact groups like uh, ON. Well. Once you show it's supported on that, that that gives uh, those are the external uh, those are the dictators basically. Yes. Yeah, so diagonal, diagonal. And um, yeah. So the okay. Somehow the smallest dimension corresponds to dictators, and we show that if you don't have a dictatorial structure, then you're supposed supported on the uh, higher uh, uh, dimensions, and then you can get better maps. Okay. Are there any more questions? Okay. <clears throat> so the idea is that if it's not a dictator, then it's supported. Yes. Yeah. And what we're going to do, what we're going to do is hyperconductivity. So it's a tool that appears uh, in the various parts of mathematics, but uh, it's one of the essential tools on the Boolean uh, cube. Um, okay. 
many times when people talk about uh, analysis of Boolean functions, they talk about applications of the hyperconductivity theorem on the um, Boolean cube by Bonami, Gauss, and Beckner. And, and we are going to, um, yeah, it's about uh, LP norms. So if, if you look at uh, the argument of Gauss, it only uses L2 norms. And hyperconductivity allows you to get better result by looking at LP norms. That's the rough way to think about it. OK, so hyperconductivity, as mentioned, is a central tool on the Boolean cube. And uh, in order to solve the problem, our idea was to try to generalize this tool to the symmetry group. And it turns out that there are no generalization of hyperconductivity to the symmetry group, but the problem is that they are not effective. And the reason why they are not effective is because there are these small dictators. So if you look, the function fx equal to xi, this is the dictator on the Boolean cube, its expectation is one half. And uh, if, you took, if you look at the function f of sigma, which is the indicator of sigma of one being one, this is f expectation <laughs> one over n. And uh, there is this difference between the Boolean cube where dictators have expectation where dictators are large and the symmetric group when dictators are small. And this makes hyperconductivity not work as effectively in the symmetric group. And we had to come up with the notion of hyperconductivity for global functions, which shows that if you exclude the dictators, you can get an effective hyperconductive result and get uh, all the nice stuff that you can get on the Boolean cube, you can then get for the symmetric group. <coughs> But for, for the settings you mentioned before with the square root n, it, it does have constant weight. Right? Uh, which I think the dictators you defined before have the set big set i, right? Yeah, so i was of size root n, and it has density one over root n, which is still small. Oh, it's over, over, over yeah. root n. Mm -hmm. And these are other applications of. Uh, uh, do you get, I mean, people who studied the random walk card shuffles on S on A. Mm -hmm. They have to also look at the finer things of the you know Daikoni Shasha or whoever started it, I can't remember oldest Daikoni. Mm -hmm. They bring in all the you know the whole young tableau and uh, the dimensions and this concentration. You get a, a, a sharp cutoff, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You have, maybe you have applications for that. Uh, so we didn't try too hard to think related. about. Yeah, it could be related to the kind of phenomena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because that's how they study at least exactly by looking at the dimensions and small dimensions don't play a big role. Big dimensions, especially with the total variation norm, which is the sharp cutoff. Yeah, actually, I haven't looked at that. Yeah, we. Yeah. But do, do, do you need any information on the representation theory? And so our proof uses the representation theory of the symmetric group. Uh, so the, yes. what, what sort of information do you need to know? Uh, so, so we have an operator on the symmetric group and we have to diagonalize it and yeah. use the structure of the eigenfunctions. Yeah. So I think the best results known for short cut of also diagonalize this offer is very well, I guess it depends what card shuffle you're doing. I take that back. Yeah. But I'm sure there's one card shuffle which is yours. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, so now we're ready to uh, discuss uh, hyperconductivity. Um, and in order to define uh, hyperconductivity, we have to define the noise operator which is a smoothing operator on the Boolean cube. So you can think of the Boolean cube as this pattern. And for a given X in the Boolean cube, we're going to define a small neighborhood around it and take the average 
and, and smooth a function of the brain cube by taking its average over uh, this small neighborhood. And uh, okay, so that's the noise operator. <coughs> and now let's define it formally. <coughs> So we're going to get this uh, y that's close to x by remembering each coordinate of x with probability rho and resampling it with probability one minus rho. So with probability rho, we rem remember it. Otherwise, we forget it and resample it and choose it uh, uniformly. And that, wa and that way, we get the y that's uh, close to the original x. And the noise operator is defined by smoothing out. So like in this picture, we have this x, we get a random y that's close to x, and we take expectation of a, a, that y that's close to x. Okay. One property that's a combinatorial way to think about hyperconductivity is small set expansion. And uh, it, it tells you that if you start with a, a small set in the Boolean cube, and take one step of this random walk when you go from y to x, you are going to leave the small set with high probability, which means that if you have a small set, then most of its elements are in its boundary. If you make a small step, you're going to leave it with high probability. And uh, yeah, and, and, and by small, to be more precise, we mean that the size of A is has density that's little over one. And if the density of A is little of one, then we leave A in one step of the random walk with high probability. That's the small set expansion theorem of KKM, which was proved using hyperconductivity. Okay, so let's end. Is there some assumption on A in the previous slide? Is it just any set? Any set, any small set. You're going to leave it with high probability. So there are large sets that you're not going to live with high probability like the dictators. So if you take the dictator, uh, you're going to stay inside with high probability, but that's not a counter example because dictators are large. So it's not an <laughs> example to small set expansion. But this is exactly why everything fails when you move to the symmetry group where the dictators are smaller. <laughs> and, uh, okay. And, Okay, so what, what is hyperconductivity about? So we have the L2 unit ball, and the L4 unit ball is always contained in the L2 unit ball because we're all over probability space. And hyperconductivity tells us uh, that the <coughs> operator sends the big L2 ball into the small L4 ball. So any operator that corresponds to random walk is a, is a contraction in LP, but we here we have this hyperconductivity, which means that we send the big ball into the small ball. And uh, in formula, it's, it's uh, written that way. So if we take the noise operator with sufficiently small uh, noise rate, then we're going to con uh, send the big L2 ball into the small L4 ball. Uh, so it means that the OF phonom is at most F2 for all of the functions F. And Okay, and one way to, to think about these uh, four norms and two norms that we have uh, two behaviors. There is the smooth behavior. So if uh, I have a distribution that's uh, sort of bounded, then the two norm is going to be uh, within a constant of the two norm. On the other hand, if we take, uh, if, if we start with a small set A, let's say, uh, yeah, let's say that A has density alpha. And, uh, and we take the indicator of A and normalize its two norm to be one. So we can divide, uh, divide it by root alpha. And then the distribution looks like this. Uh, we have, uh, we take the value uh, one over root alpha with probability alpha. 
And this is a case uh, where the phonon is not within a constant of the two norms. The phonon is much larger than the two norms. So gaps between the phonon and the two norms are about peaks in the distributions. They mean that you take a, a very large value with a small probability. And the noise operator is a smoothing operator, so we expect it to uh, get rid of all these peaks and get the phonon to be within a constant of the two norm. Okay. So if you so okay, so and one consequence of hyperconductivity is that if we look at low degree polynomials, they have this smooth behavior. So suppose that we have a function f. And we can write it as a multilinear polynomial, which is the same as its Fourier expansion. So we can write f to the sum of as is. And where chi s is the product over all i s of x i. And, uh, and f is said to, to be of degree d if it's a multilinear polynomial of degree d. So the degree of f uh, is the maximal s such that uh, a s is uh, non zero. And, and uh, hyperconductivity implies that these low degree functions have this smooth behavior, this barred behavior when the phonon is within a constant of the phonon. Okay, so uh, let's uh, prove that. <laughs> so um okay so it turns out that the noise operator has this neat uh, Fourier formula which means that tiro f is the sum over rho to the s f s s chi s And th this means that it's diagonalized by the homogeneous degree D polynomials. So if a function is homogeneous of degree D, so a homogeneous polynomial of degree D, then it's an eigenfunction of the noise operator. And so if F is homogeneous of degree D, then we get that. Uh, Tiro F formal, let's say that the uh, is like one to root three. So on the one hand, it's rho to the D times F formal. On the other hand, it's at most the two norm of F. So we get immediately that the hom homogeneous polynomial of the gritty have a phonom which is bounded in terms of the two norm. Um, okay, so let's just uh, spend a minute to connect it to the uh, to the symmetry group. So it turns out that low multiplicities Are in correspondence with low degree polynomials. So the point you're taking advantage of is you have a function on this group, you expand it in the representations, and the function to which you want to apply your combinatorial argument involves a lot of the frequent all the representations, and you're working out the weights of the Fourier coefficients in the different representations balanced against the multiplicity. 
Exactly. We want to say that uh, all the weight of the function is on the large multiplicity. On the large multiplicity where you have a better, where you have a bigger multiplicity. Exactly. And the way to say it is say that the low degree polynomials, yeah. they are in correspondence with the low multiplicities and they behave in the opposite way to Boolean functions. Boolean functions have this picky behavior and low degree polynomials have this uh, smooth behavior. So it means that these Boolean functions are going to be uncorrelated with this low degree polynomial, polynomials and they have all the uh, mass on the high degrees and therefore have large multiplicities and better eigenvalues. Thanks. Does it make sense if your function you're expanding has this property? <laughs> that you understand where the frequencies are, which of course in the Boolean case. Is yes, so in the Boolean case, you have this hypercontractivity that tells you that every small set is uncorrelated with the low degree functions. The problem is that it fails in the yes. symmetric group and you have to come up with a way to fix that. Okay, so <clears throat> what do we have so far? We had hypercontractivity, and uh, we had this uh, commentator way of thinking about it, which is small set expansion, which means that if you have a small set, then you leave it with hypermobility, and we have this smoothness of uh, low degree functions that uh, is equivalent to hypercontractivity. That means that low degree functions have this smooth behavior. Okay, and we would like to generalize it to the symmetric group, but one nice model to think about is the product space one up to m to the n, because you can view uh, you can view the symmetric group as a subset of uh, uh, one up to n to the n uh, by looking at as vectors that have all their coordinates uh, distinct. Uh, so as, so one up to m to the n when m is very large. Is a good model for the symmetric group. Okay. And in all of these other uh, domains, it's easy to define what dictators are. And it turns out that in order to talk about hyperconductivity, all you need to know are what the dictators are. You don't need to know. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so, so representation theory is. Uh, is also there behind the scenes, but in order to define, uh, to talk about hyperconductivity, all you need to know uh, are what the dictators are and what are they in every uh, setting. So in, in the Boolean cube, you have the, the xi, and as mentioned, the symmetric group, uh, you have these functions that are one when sigma sends one to one or any i, so uh, j. And once you know what the dictators are, you can talk about, uh, you can define what are the low degree functions and talk about smoothness of low degree functions because you can define the product of the dictators to be of degree D. And, D, and uh, you can say that the function is of degree at most D if and only if it's a linear combination of a product of the dictators. And, uh, and now we can ask whether hyperconductivity is true. Is it true that the phonome of a function of degree at most d is always at most a constant uh, within its two norm, whether we have the smoothness of low degree functions. Yeah, so we can ask it, but the answer is no. Uh, not in the symmetric group and not in this uh, one up to m to the n. And the reason is that we have these small dictators. So if we have a dictator <laughs> whose expectation is alpha and alpha is little over one, then the two norm is going to be root alpha and the phonome is going to be alpha to one over four. So the two norm is, is little o of the phonome, even though the dictators are of degree one. We have a degree one function that doesn't, that's not smooth. So we have no hope of getting hyperconductivity for all the functions. And the only way to get something meaningful is by excluding the dictators. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, let us see the pictures for, for long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, you should let us. Some of us are almost blind. Okay. Let's speak. Okay, cool. So uh, let's summarize what we had so far. So many spaces have notions of dictators. It turns out that all you need in order to that's all you need in order to talk about hyperconductivity because once you know what the dictators are, you can talk about low degree functions. And, and 
and, and then you can ask whether you have a smoothness of logical functions. Um, and the problem is that if dictators are small, if you have sparse dictators, then uh, you can no longer hope for hypercontractivity. And the solution is to prove, is to somehow exclude the dictators and prove hypercontractivity only for the global functions. <coughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about. Okay, so, so we saw start, we start that uh, uh, low degree functions are no longer smooth in uh, the other settings. Let's talk also about uh, a small sort of expansion, hyperconductivity, and show that this fails as well. So, in order to do that, we'll have to define the noise operator in these other settings. And uh, the noise operator is defined the same way. So, if we have uh, an X, we're going to take the noisy version by uh, with probability rho remembering the coordinates and with probability one minus rho forgetting them and resampling them and uniformly out of one up to n. And then again, we have this noise operator that takes expectation of a small neighborhood around x and smooths uh, the function. And, and the dictators, they want small set expansion. So why is that? We can take the dictator. And if we take a random X in A and choose a, a random, take one step of this uh, noisy, take a noisy version of A or of X, then with probability of all, Y1 is going to be X1. And, and we think of all as a constant. Yeah, so let's think of all as one half. Then we get the probability that Y in A is at least one half. And even, and when the dictators are small, this becomes a problem. So. Dictators are always, always do not expand for the noise operator, but when the dictators become small, this is uh, bad news for small set expansion. <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, okay, so, so you don't have a small set expansion. It turns out that you also don't have a fifty. This is just some calculation. You can plug it in. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, there are some dictators going suddenly anti global. Anti global. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so one way to deal with these sparse dictators is to prove hyperconductivity that's true for all the functions, and then you get this noise rate to be to tend to zero with n, and that's won't give you a very effective hyperconductive results. And what we did is to exclude these dictators uh, and prove hyperconductivity only for the global functions. Okay. okay, so this is like messy, so I'll write it down. Are you going to put small set expansion for uh, unstructured small sets? Exactly. Yeah. We want to, yeah, want to say that if they don't look like dictators, then we can still get hyperconductivity. <laughs> Okay, so in order to define our notion of globalness, we'll have to define these restrictions. So, and so if we have a function on m to the n, we can, and we have I don't know, so x in m, we can restrict one to x and get a function on the rest of the coordinate by taking f1 up to x of y to be f of xy. So this is a notation for plugging in x in the first coordinate. And uh, like, and more generally, you can plug in uh, you can get a function f s to x from um, on the rest of the coordinates by plugging in uh, all x is in m to the s by plugging in. Uh, x in the coordinate of s and getting a function 
on the rest of the coordinates. Okay, so these are the restrictions and our notion of globalness means that when we take the restrictions of our function, our two norm doesn't become too large. And, uh, okay. and so, so it means that if we take, we restrict, uh, okay, so, so this includes, this notion includes the empty set. So it means that the two norm of F is at most epsilon. And also means that if we restrict one coordinate, it's two norm is going to be at most 100 times epsilon. And if we restrict two coordinates, it's going to be at most uh, 100 squares times epsilon and so on. Uh, so it's really a notion about small sets. It sort of uh, uh, <coughs> explodes as the size of the set uh, gets larger. And the best epsilon that you can take here is the two norm of F. And this is like the best globalness notion where you expect to recover everything that you have on the Boolean cube. And there's also the uh, trivial epsilon that you can take, which is the infinity norm, because the two norm of F S to X is at most its infinity norm, uh, which is at most infinity norm of F. And when you get epsilon to be better than, when epsilon is better than trivial, you want to get some better than trivial results. And when epsilon is best, you want to really recover everything that you have on the Boolean cube. Okay, so let's uh, give some examples. So the dictators are the ultimate examples of uh, functions that are not global. If we restrict a, a coordinate of the dictator, we can make its two norm to be one. Uh, on the other hand, the examples of global sets, you can take, you can think of, uh, of it as a pseudo randomness notion by taking the indicator of a random set. <coughs> and, and, uh, and another way to think about it is that it says that your behavior is like in the Boolean cube. So if you encode a function on the uh, one, so, so if, uh, so if f of x depends uh, only on whether uh, x is even or odd, Then you get, then you actually encode the function of the Boolean cube, and uh, in this, this is uh, so every function of the Boolean cube can be encoded as a global function on one up to one to the n. And uh, the point is that if you have uh, this uh, behavior that, that uh, yeah, that explains somehow why we only see this notion in uh, for large M and don't see this notion in the Boolean cube because they're automatically all the functions are global. And what we proved is that we indeed have, uh, we, we can, when we take epsilon to be the best epsilon, we can recover everything and get that zero F four norm is at most the two norm of F. And we also get something non-trivial whenever epsilon is little over the infinity norm of F. So here, if F is the indicator of a set, uh, yeah, so we get this smoothness of low degree functions, we get hyperconductivity, and this is small set expansion that we get whenever epsilon is little of one. We don't need epsilon to be best for the whole, it's sufficient for epsilon to be a little of one. Low degree and global? Um, right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, okay, so to summarize, uh, okay, so and this is the last slide. So um, the, the main point of the talks are that the extremal product, product presets in the alternating group are the dictators. So dictators do not only appear on the Boolean cube uh, and in extremal problems for sets, they are also important in a, a multiplicative combinatorics and they appear as extremal solutions there as well. And the other, uh, uh, message of the talk is that you should go for hyperconductivity for global functions whenever you have a space that has small dictators. There you don't expect to have hyperconductivity, but you should actually go for hyperconductivity for global functions. Okay. Any questions? 
If I'm not mistaken, you mentioned the result of Eberhardt, where he gets uh, this with law. Yes, so we get. Yeah. So can you say a word about what his method is and how it compares with? Um, yeah, so his method is about anti consideration of linear functions, and uh, we make use of the pseudo randomness. Yeah, so, so we make use of the, the fact that the coefficients are negative to say something about the, low degree, the linear part of the function, and we make use of the pseudo randomness to get uh, better things, and, and uh, that's how we get it. Something very basic in your talk. I see that your estimates would be the right order of magnitude, even certainly the right exponent for the biggest such set, which is, well, which is an anti group, whatever you're calling it. What I don't see is how you actually extract the structure yes. from the proof. Yes. So you have all these coefficients, and you know that these can't, can't contribute, but then you're telling me it's mainly the high degree coefficients that are responsible for the set, but how do you recover the structure? Because you, your theorem is that there exists, you, you're predicting that it's of the type of Kedlaya, maybe that's much more general than I'm thinking. Yes, so, um, so our results, they, they don't tell you that always your, your function comes from the high degrees, it tells you that either the functions come from the high degrees, degree or, and then you have a much better bounds. Yeah. And in the otherwise case, you, are, you have a dictatorial structure, and then you make use of this dictatorial structure to show that dictators are the external family. It within the high degree one. Okay. Dictators are small degree, they are degree one. Right, right, but they're not playing a role in this. I thought that it's the high degree representations with the Fourier coefficients of your extremal set level are mixed up. Uh, yeah, so. Um, I mean, you're giving an exact extremal answer, which is rather unusual for people who write. Bigger, bigger, bigger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my confusion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe in the Boolean clue already, that you keep on saying dictators are these one functions of one variable. Maybe that's proved exactly. Is that yeah, right? So it's a, a bit similar to what happens in the Boolean cube when you have these approximation of the results that are. The yeah, so maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah. So maybe that's where the phenomena is that I'm not familiar with. So in the Boolean cube, you actually prove the extremal is yeah, the function yeah. of one variable. Yeah, exactly. You start with rough structure and then you, you somehow. So how, do you, how, do you, how do you get rid of the. Are you doing this kind of soft analysis? It's like a regular combinatorial type. analysis. At what point do you have it? <laughs> So, so it's a little bit like a, a regularity method that you have, you divide your uh, set into parts that each of them uh, doesn't have dictatorial structure, and then you can sort of say that your set has a specific structure, and then after that you have this rough structure, you will get it to be, uh, you can say it's, it's exactly a, a dictator. So, so I'm and, missing that last step. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. I mean, uh, I'd imagine you're very approximately. Okay, yeah, let, let's, okay, let, let me explain a little bit about the large step, steps. So, suppose that you have a set A, and you know that, uh, um, and you know that when you take the restrictions. So we have a Boolean cube here, just for ah, Even the symmetry group, A is a subset of the symmetry group. And you can take a, the set of all permutations that send one to I. And let's say that you have a set I uh, such that the measure of A1 to I is uh, large yeah. <coughs> for all uh, I to I, all I I. Then you can look at uh, these triples A1 to I, A1 to J, and A I to J. And these are a product free triple. If you take product of element here and here, you get an element here. Yeah. So you know that these two are large, and then you get that this is very small. And whatever you uh, you gain by putting something outside of the dictator here, you're going to lose much more inside the dictator here and there. And that's how we show the dictator for external. This is true for Hubble too. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so we didn't, <laughs> to some extent, yeah. But, but you, you, seem exactly. to always, uh, yeah, you seem to have a complete understanding of the problem. Yeah. Is it true for small m? That uh, uh, that's right. Uh, for, for n, like, yeah, I mean, 10, 10 is, uh, n, 10 factorial is quite big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. we didn't try to get like the right constant, so it, it's hard for me to say. Uh, how different? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, how how different are things for matrix groups? For matrix groups. Okay. Yeah. So it, it could be that. Yeah. So okay. So so also look at this problem in the uh, in the compact group setting where you ask about the largest Hall measure of, of a product free set. Uh, and there things are somewhat. So. so then you actually don't need hyperconductivity for global functions. It turns out that if you have a matrix, uh, and you know, and you should think of the dictators as the entries, the entries of the matrix. And these entries have smooth behavior. Um, and so there you actually have hyperconductivity for all functions. And uh, there was, there is a paper that, about uh, hyperconductivity in the uh, in ON for the plus the Rami operator using Ricci curvature, uh, which is the field, but we actually used uh, a different approach uh, that we used earlier in the symmetric group to get hyperconductivity. <laughs> uh, and uh, we used it for, uh, for ON to get better results and get better uh, level inequalities. And what about finite fields? Maybe this is a finite and yeah, so that's that's an open, a nice open problem that probably the methods probably should be dictators. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a nice characterization for what are the epsilon blah blah low degree polynomials are? What do you mean by characterization? What are the epsilon global uh, low degree? Just polynomials that depend on many variables? Or? Yeah, you think, yeah, if, if they don't depend too strongly on a given variable, this is like, yeah. But, but what, what we show is like that. Uh, yeah, if, if you have a function that's global, if f is global, if f is global, then you can project it to uh, to the space of low degree functions, and here you are going to get uh, a global function. This is like the way you show that globalness is reserved and even improved when it, uh, you go to the low degree part. Okay, there are no further questions, and let's thank the one again.